I look at our, uh, our NHS and I think we're pretty good at solving acute problems. What we've been less good at is setting strategic direction and addressing longer-term problems. So when I look at the problems in accident and emergency, what we see is a patient with a chronic long-term condition where there are acute exacerbations in winter. And everybody's known this, but it's been in the too difficult box for too long. It's been too difficult politically, it's been too difficult professionally, and it's been too difficult to explain to the public. a and were really put in place in the early 1970s, and at that time, most hospitals could treat most patients with most conditions to the international standard of the day. But several things have happened in those 40 years. Science has advanced, technology has advanced, the way people do business in society has advanced, and a set of expectations have changed. And the end result of that is that, quite frankly, all hospitals and all a and are simply not the same. When Keith Willett was National Clinical Director for Trauma, he arranged for the designation of only 25 a and to deal with major trauma. Lots of people squealed. They said the extra travel time will make, make things bad for the patients. We've seen a 20% increase in survival for equivalent injuries. We already have a two-tier system. All we are doing is formalizing that and bringing an inconvenient truth to the attention of the public. All of this business about accident emergencies is politically hot, particularly in winter. Um, now, we have a bunch of short-term plans to deal with winter problems. This year it looks slightly better than it did last year. But still, people are tired, people are working hard in A&Es. There, are, there is the risk that we run into difficulty over winter. But what I would plea is that we don't get into a position where, for various reasons, we manufacture a crisis before it actually happens. We may have plans for this winter and for the immediate future. What we've needed desperately for some time is a longer-term plan for our urgent and emergency care systems. But the first question is why do people, so many people, go to A&E? They go because A&E is a safety net. It's a good place to go. You know you'll be seen in four hours. So clearly we need to offer a better alternative away from hospitals. So the basis of the review which we published today is is in two areas. The first is how do we provide a better offer for patients out of hospital and how do we provide better care for those patients who are seriously ill and arrive in a hospital. We've divided our review into five different areas. The first is to address how we can provide uh, better care or, or, or enable people to care for themselves better in their own homes. And there are issues there about personal care planning, uh, provided by GPs, providing patients with better information. The second uh, thing is that we've looked at how we can actually provide facilities, if you like, closer to people's home. And we focused in particular on uh, aspects of primary care. We believe that there should be access to primary care um, for urgent conditions every day of the week. We also believe that pharmacies are grossly underused. We've seen how, how much greater they're used in, in other parts of Europe for dealing with problems. Um, and we also think that paramedics, who are highly respected individuals with enormous clinical expertise, who we trust when we're in desperate shape um, after an accident, and yet for the rest of the time we use them to transport patients rather than actually treat them. We also believe that we need easier access for people. We want to beef up the 111 service, which got off to, frankly, a relatively bad start. But that doesn't deny the fact that it's a good principle. And what the feedback has come, uh, has, has come back to us as, uh, following that is that there are two things in particular patients want. Firstly, they want to be able to talk to a clinician uh, if they need to. And by a clinician, I mean a nurse, a doctor, a dentist, a pharmacist, or somebody from a mental health or community team. And we believe that we can put that in place. The second thing they want is that if they need to be seen somewhere, that the 111 service could fix that up. Now, that might mean calling an ambulance at one extreme. At the other end, it might mean fixing up an appointment for your GP the following day or to see your hospital specialist or to see a community nurse. That is eminently doable. And then... We need to review and be absolutely honest and transparent 
about what services different accident and emergency services provide. So what we're proposing to do is to go absolutely public with that and designate those hospitals that are capable of treating the most serious life-threatening conditions um, as major emergency centers. Now, that constitutes less than 5% of the activity that is seen in A&Es. So it's absolutely ludicrous to suggest that, um, that what we're doing is downgrading the remainder because actually most of the serious patients already go to those uh, those A&Es which are attached to hospitals capable of dealing with uh, significant conditions. And then finally, we believe that there is a lot of merit in linking the major specialist centres with uh, other A&Es in the region so that we have a network. Now, most networks, such as cancer networks or, or other types of networks, deal with bringing patients into specialist centres. Well, we want these networks to have that flow where it's particularly appropriate, but more importantly, we want the networks to also take the expertise out to the patients. But the issue is that there is an enormous opportunity if we seize the ambition to improve our uh, urgent and emergency care services.